All right, so today is Wednesday, July 17th, uh, week two of the program. Recording is on. Um, so as we get started today, I uh, want to kind of go over our homework assignment that we turned in and kind of set up some of the content uh, for week three. But uh, before I, I do any of that, any general questions about anything? Okay. So the other thing that we will need to do, I'm going to go back here, is back to people and the project teams. All right. So these are the four project teams, and everybody has been assigned to one of those four teams. So at this point, what I would say is, each of the teams needs to select a company that you want to work on uh, for your kind of semester long group project. And so um, it can be any company that we're not working on in the class. So clearly NVIDIA would not be a, a company or an industry that you can choose. Uh, and, and so again, each of the sections of the class, which relate to the homework you're gonna be doing. So for example, you don't have to wait till week seven when you're doing the presentations to start on an EIC analysis for the company that you are analyzing. Okay. And so once you choose the company, um, I will create under the files folder folder uh, for each of the companies you've chosen. And I will start uploading data from Bloomberg as well, uh, since you generally don't have access to that uh, to help you uh, with your analysis for the companies that you have chosen. So I'll give you to next week <laughs> to choose your company, but start talking amongst yourselves if you haven't already, and then just let me know on behalf of your team. And then I'll also just lay it to project teams, one, two, three, four, I'll change the names to include the companies that you have chosen. So everybody knows what we are working on this semester. So that's gonna be the group projects. Again, you'll make a presentation, final class, 20 minutes, um, and that will be 40% uh, of your grade. Questions about the projects? Hmm. All right. Well, let's talk about EIC. So <clears throat> this week, uh, you should have done the EIC analysis on NVIDIA. And I had given you um, some data. So I'll just pop here into the files folder. And for NVIDIA, we'll start out with the economic impact, the E. And you should have been uh, referring to this <laughs> screenshot when you were talking about it. So why don't somebody tell me, how did you answer the question about whether NVIDIA and this industry are economically sensitive? Gregory? So uh, in my analysis, I said that it was, it was more economically sensitive than, under in, than other industries. Um, because the beta is higher than one, that generally shows that it has a higher like risk portfolio when when facing economic conditions. With that said, um, it looks like NVIDIA is even higher than the industry average because it has a, a 1.9 versus a 1.75 of the industry. Okay, so, uh, you know, good starting answer. Just make sure that I, I hope in your first part that you did reference the 1.75 when you said it's higher than average, as opposed to just saying it's higher than average. And, and that's just gonna be important in general beyond this class is to use numbers when you're answering these questions. But yes, so market, very sensitive at 175, NVIDIA even more sensitive at 190. And then ideally, why? Like, why is the semiconductor industry more economically sensitive? Why does it have such a high beta? Uh, Jim? Uh, it's, it's an input into um, consumer spending and uh, products, electronics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also 
uh, the business cycle. Uh, and a lot of uh, CapEx goes into uh, data centers and such. And um, the trend now is uh, a lot of uh, ML and AI spend with all the large cloud providers. Mm -hmm. and, and so there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of a, a site, uh, it, it's, it's very heavily uh, correlated to economic cycles and, and um, the spending. Uh, so that, I guess that's the man side. Okay. Well, and, and, and you kind of referenced data centers, like who does, well, um, Craig, you're going to add to that? I was going to say the technology life cycle as well for some of these products too. When you, when you say technology life cycle, what do you mean by that? Like, you know, some of the, some of the technology that's like, you know, today is going to be outdated next year. Right. So that's what I mean by, uh, technology life cycle. So it's kind of risky to invest in a company that might be doing well right now, but then, you know, they're, they have a product that's really outdated and not, you know, competitive next year or the year after. So. Okay. And you're saying that makes for more volatility in the business. Yes. Yes. Okay. Patrick. Yeah. Go, going along with, with Craig's thought, um, there is, you know, a lot of industry sort of turnover, but also the product itself has a ton of upfront costs. So if demand goes down at all, then the industry is quickly sort of in trouble with their, their margins. Okay. <clears throat> well, I was, was going to say when, when the first mention is that the other thing that's happening here is what you're describing is this is a B2B industry. This is not a B2C industry. And, and so generally, you know, in, in boom cycles, companies spend more, bus cycles, companies spend less. So that that's also driving, I think, some of the volatility of semiconductors uh, in terms of where they're getting their customers and their revenue and, and the spend. Uh, Jan? I look at it more as a discretionary type of an industry where um, the status quo is not necessarily affected by the changes in uh, technology. So it's something that will definitely, you know, guide us and change our style of life uh, in the future. But if uh, the economy is bad, then people probably would be more concerned about, you know, other types of industry. So I think that's probably the reason. Yeah. And so whether they're switching out or it's that volatility uh, of the cycles that they're tied to, which gets back to uh, what people had said before. So, but I guess that's the idea is that when you think about the economic sensitivity, yeah, there's kind of like the technical side uh, that we're trying to look at here, but then there's the why. Why is that number what it is as opposed to just you're, you're looking at a high volatility number. And so that's what we're also trying to explain. So good. My thoughts on on the uh, semiconductors. Um, what makes Nvidia more cyclical than the average semiconductor company for the higher beta? Why is Nvidia even more sensitive? You have to look at its supply chain. Um... Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I think we have to look at its supply chain, who are his end customers, and depending on them, you can have why it's so technical. Yeah. Um, Young, you're going to add, add to that? Um, I, I think you might have to do with the limited you know, focus on their business and, and the fact that um, their business relies on the types of newer uh, chip model releases. Uh, that would be my guess. So there's newer chip models. The other thing is that I'm just kind of guessing here, but you know, half of NVIDIA sales are going to four companies. Uh, it's going to Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, and uh, Google. A and I think that's also probably driving a little bit of the higher beta right now because these companies are all spending dramatically on AI uh, and, and it's really pushing. But the flip side is that if something happens and they all cut back, and Nvidia is kind of screwed, because you know that that's where, as I said, a good chunk of their revenue and, and growth is coming from is all these data center investments at those four companies, and that I, I think probably makes them a little bit more volatile 
than the average company because we're not talking about a diversified portfolio here, even though high beta. Uh, we're talking about a lot of concentration risk and the types of business that they're in. So I, I think that does probably add to a little bit of an individual risk for that stock. But that being said, we, we talked about the ease. We know we have a, a very cyclical industry and, mm -hmm. and, and a very even more cyclical NVIDIA right now in a boom cycle, Jen. Um, I was going to mention also that uh, the semiconductor industry uh, relies a lot on uh, inventories. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think with the sp spend on the um, the large cloud companies, um, I, I think NVIDIA is the only game in town for what they want to do um, with their software and their platform and their um, uh, vertical integration. So. So um, they they and and they're running shortages. So the the man out outstrips the supply, and so um, and and you're right. If if they if all of a sudden um, they're in a downturn and they want to stop spending, then uh, they're in for a world of hurt. Uh, as I said, very a lot of concentration risk uh, with Nvidia and their customers and their markets. So exactly. All right, so let's move on to the I and, and the industry. And <clears throat> the key here, first of all, is is this an attractive industry? And what numbers are you looking at? Yep. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, yeah, it is a, a very attractive industry because it has a large spread that the ROIC is much larger than the WAC on average. and. Nvidia is even more, you know, even has a competitive advantage because they have a, you know, the 91 percent versus the 13 is much e even higher large spread than the 57 versus the 12 of the industry average. Yeah, just make sure that you talk about the 57.95 and the 12.47 when you talk about high spread. So don't just say it has high spread. That that's, again, that's a coin flip. You could say high spread, low spread, be wrong or right just because you made a generic comment. When you use numbers, it helps to make sure you understand why you're saying it's an attractive industry. So again, very attractive industry, right? So here's the next point, five forces. Basically, using the five forces, which you should have said is, explain that spread. Explain the 58% ROIC against a 12.5% WAC. That's what you're saying with the five forces model. What's causing that? Buyer, supplier, entry, exit. Like, how, how did you guys answer that? What forces are favorable here and why? Uh, Nathan? Uh, one major one is the barriers to entry to even get in the, the game. Um, it takes so much capital cost just to get the equipment, the personnel, the spacing to, to develop this technology. So it keeps a lot of the competition from even entering. Yeah, so for semiconductors, I, I think these fabs, tens of billions of dollars. Um, and what else? What, what else? What's other barrier to entry beyond the very high cost to build these facilities and the tooling? Who else was answering that question? Young, get a hand up. Yeah, uh, I didn't catch the last part. Could you repeat that question one more time? What sir? else? Barriers to entry high. One is the capital cost, but there's another barrier to entry. What else? Uh, is there's a skill barrier because it requires a highly skilled and um, highly educated workforce in order to uh, develop these chips. So I think that. Absolutely. And, and there's, there's one other big one, KM. Um, I would say that their threats of substitutes is low. Um, when I looked at the, the article that you gave us, it talked about that they're the ones that are leading in um, the semiconductor space. They have other pieces, but their um, technology um, stands out. So there's really no true substitute because of how they package it um, for others to come in and take over. Yeah, and, and and technically you could argue quantum computing might be a substitute, but I don't think it's very viable today. Um, and, and so there, there might be alternatives to traditional semiconductors, but as you said, not a substantial substitute today. But I, I still want to answer the barrier to entry. There's one more barrier to entry I want to make sure we get to. 
that's that's beneficial and high. Stephen? Yeah, I was going to say the legal aspect. So uh, patents for the technology. Exactly. Yeah, that patent and IP is really, really critical to semiconductor industry. Look at the example of Apple, which for years has been trying to kick Qualcomm out of the iPhone because they pay Qualcomm all the money for the chips uh, or the uh, 5G and, and other network connections, and they've been un unable to do it. They partnered with Intel, spent a bunch of money to create their own chips, and they got caught in the morass of patents and couldn't get out of it and, and basically had to abandon the effort and at the same time go crawling back to Qualcomm and pay even more money to get back in the in the uh, the phone and, and they're you know they're saying the same thing you know they still Apple has a long term goal of of replacing Qualcomm but they're having a lot of trouble doing it because of that patent fortress that involves the industry that's just an example so so that's the other thing so beyond the high cost you got some very proprietary IP around some of these advanced designs mm -hmm. and and that tends to benefit this industry. So we don't have a lot of substitutes. We got really strong barriers to entry. What else is explaining this high spread? What about the other forces? Yeah, Michael. I said a low buyer power. It's a very diverse buyer pool, very industry agnostic. I mean, so many industries and companies are buying and using semiconductors, so they're not tied to one single buyer. Okay. And I think there's something else that limits the buyer power here. Jim? Uh, I think there's high switching costs. Uh, you have to use NVIDIA's uh, CUDA software and um, it, it's very, very hard to, uh, like a, AMD doesn't have a substitute like because of the IP and also because of um you you just can't just copy uh the the advancements that they have in their chips <clears throat> but that's the point like there's a commodity aspect to semiconductors but there's also this kind of specialization and that specialization is as you said has high switching costs um sometimes you you have to go to very specific vendors uh maybe you're using a specific design and, and that actually adds to their ability uh to make more money because it spills over into rivalry, and that's to some degree tends to reduce the rivalry. In many cases, you're, you're dealing with essentially oligopolistic competition as opposed to pure market competition. Uh, this is not a commodity business at its heart. So there's a commodity aspect to semiconductors, but a lot of the high end stuff is, is not commoditized. And, and I think that benefits the returns that you see here. Uh, KN, you want to add to that? Yeah, one more thing to that, what you just said. Um, one thing that I remember reading, it says, um, Bloomberg mentioned that NVIDIA has a turnkey proprietary, proprietary AI factory that mirrors Apple's smart form, um, smart form dominance. And because of that, it talked about their platform and their expansion into software and services. So they're not just looking at just the actual product themselves, but the software, which is also another dominant field for companies who are creating dominance in the technology space. And, and as somebody said, if you're tied to that software, it adds to your switching costs because you're more locked into those platforms. Yep. Young? Yeah, just adding to that, I think um, there was a, a quote from Bloomberg Intelligence that you gave us uh, where it says that they have a near monopoly in AI server uh, GPU market. So yeah, I think that goes right along with that. You're talking about NVIDIA? Yes. Yeah. NVIDIA. And just be careful when you when you enter the eye, remember you're talking about the industry, not a specific company. So you use companies as examples for the industry, but that's the C section, right? As opposed to the I section. So I agree with what you just said. Remember that here we're still talking about the industry and you don't want to get caught up. Some people do five forces on the company and that's not what it was meant to be. It's five forces out of the industry. All right. Uh, what about supplier power? Do the suppliers have power in this industry? Steven? I, I actually had a question about this because in IBIS world, um, their analysis said that it's fairly neutral because the manufacturers and um, 
mutually benefited from working together. Mm -hmm. But I would think that like somebody like TSMC would have a huge monopoly over that. So they would actually get, get to like control that a bit more. Um, so, so yeah, I wanted to ask about that specifically. Well, somebody pointed out because we do a similar assignment in yesterday's class, the TSMC has extraordinarily high margins. Um, now, relatively low investment, but high margins relative to the industry. Uh, and, and I think the conversation is around TSMC actually has a lot of power uh, because they are the premier contract manufacturer and they're getting more and more concentrated, but they don't seem to be exercising in a way that's hurting the industry. And I think that goes probably to the IBIS world, you know, comment about almost like partnership. It's they look like, like they, they don't need to, to, you know, drive these people down in the prices they charge because they can charge a premium. The companies can charge a premium. They're both making money. And so I think it's almost like, you know, back in the day, it was the cereal companies. Like for grocery stores, cereal was one of the, uh, as a matter of fact, you go to a grocery store chain, look at how much shelf space they give a product. When you see lots and lots of shelf space, that's a very profitable product for grocery stores, right? Because they're a low margin business and they're going to give a lot of shelf space to things and take a lot of inventory that don't make a lot of money. So that was the thing. Like the cereal manufacturers, in a way, were win win and symbiotic with the grocery store chains because the cereal made a lot of money, the grocery stores made a lot of money from cereal, and it was kind of win win. And, and in a way, they protected that for years of having other brands coming in because the big brands that were you pay four dollars a box of cereal actually allowed the grocery stores to make a lot of money and decent margin on those cereals so i think the similar thing is happening here in the semiconductor industry like yeah the suppliers have power but they they're not exercising in a way that's really hurting the industry so maybe we'll call that for that force neutral with that but four of the five forces are really really favorable and supplier power is at best neutral and is not really working against the industry and I think that's why you're seeing such a high spread today. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to explain the spread with the forces. And then the next question is, is any of that going to change in five years? Will any of these forces change? Because if they're not, then that spread's likely to stay pretty high. Or is it going to get more unfavorable or even more favorable? Like, like what did you say about five years out? So five forces, five years. Can? I actually said with the five forces, it's actually going to get more to NVIDIA's advantage because <clears throat> of looking at their cash that they're generating and also the cash they're infusing to an R and D and making themselves more um, competitive and just by their share size. So that's what I was um, mentioning that as well. Again, reminder, this, when you talk about five years, we're still industry, not competitive advantage. So it's it's not NVIDIA's advantage in this section, it's semiconductor industry advantage in this section. NVIDIA is the next section. Okay. So, Stephen? Yeah, I thought uh, competition played a huge role here because um, the, uh, I don't wanna say other companies, but other companies will try to compete for the market share and uh they would lower their prices and i think that would be able to take away some of the market share from companies like nvidia and obviously if they're lowering their prices or engage in some level of a price war that uh the roic would go down um and that would affect the spread well when you think of competition um particularly for the higher end high value chips i think the customers are actively encouraging competition meaning amazon wants competition uh meta wants competition in semiconductors because they they view that as helping them lower their costs so in a way I, I think your buyers would like to see a little bit more power and, and right now they don't have a lot of power and, and competition would help them gain a little power and maybe hurt the margins slightly in the industry so I, I you could argue that buyer power might slightly increase if there is more competition and the rivalry might also be a little higher and I think the other thing that's happening here is governments. How do governments play a role in this? What's going on there? So there's a government initiative from CHIPS Act and Inflation Reduction Act where they're trying to bring in 
a lot of these uh, semiconductor foundries. And also there's a subsidies that's going into folks that are developing these um, artificial uh, intelligence related hardware. So I think from the uh, data that we're given, they mentioned that Meta, Apple and Google, uh, they would be entering uh, into manufacturing some of their own um, you know, uh, parallel computing uh, hardware. So while we're looking at the printouts over here, to use. we're not seeing um, scan this these list automatically. traditional Press the space software bar companies. Like the companies. Yeah, thank you. Go yeah, uh, traditional software companies, they're entering in. So threat of new entrants will change. Um, like you mentioned, there's going to be a little bit more development in quantum computing as well. So I think there's going to be uh, that much closer to a threat of a replacement. And uh, yeah, that would be my two. So let's start with the premise that what, what's somewhere around 80% of the world's chips are coming out of Taiwan, and, and that's too much concentration risk, right? And, and so that's the point. Like, you know, you're seeing other con countries, US, Europe, even Latin America, looking to move chip production into other areas of the world. That's to some degree creating competition. And unfortunately, we, we can't get past, you know, the, the China, Taiwan, however you want to call it, mess of a relationship where, you know, what 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 I'm reading as, as a novice and the outsider is that, you know, President Xi of China is pretty much saying that in 2027, 2028, he wants Taiwan back in. Like, that's what they're building to. And, and if there is some form of conflict associated with that, that could really upend this industry. And so from an industry standpoint, taking out the, the military aspects of this, I, I think that there's some risk here. And, and so that's why I think the world wants more rivalry. They want more choice. They want more diversification. And, and I think that in a way could start to hurt the ROIs for another reason. You're spending lots and lots of money in other parts of the world. And then you actually start to get more competition because the governments are adding those subsidies. So you can make an argument that the returns are likely to start to fall over the next five years. And by the way, that's come. Like if you think about a couple of the charts in the book that talk about regression of the mean, like we should see regression of the mean over time in growth and in returns. So no industry maintains this level of return forever. And, and so it's a question of how long before it starts to regress the mean. But I think in the next five years, not that they're not gonna have a high spread, but I think the spread might start to come down because we are, kind of creaking up some of the barriers that we talked about. We are potentially seeing some substitutes become much more viable. We are seeing the, the customers trying to assert more choice and therefore more competition and more standardization of the products they use and to some degree commoditization. And you are seeing potentially more rivalry. Uh, and, and at that point, you could also potentially see some of these contract manufacturers starting to assert more power. Uh, as they try and generate better returns for themselves. So I, I don't know. I, I think you make a, a case based on what people are saying that this industry could see a slightly lower spread as the forces get a little less favorable. I think it's going to go to a negative spread, but I don't think you're going to keep making 90% plus ROIs. So again, you might differ and, and you can come up with a couple of different scenarios here, but that's what you need to do. You got to have a point of view. You got to tie it back to the forces and, and then make a call. And that's how I'm going to be grading this as a process assignment. Greg? Just out of curiosity regarding this industry. So it is very like supply chain, global supply chain interdependent, which is why we're seeing some of the policy you just talked about. Yeah. Is what is the reason why we're seeing a lot of this like whack to ROIC, very like nice spread, if you will. Uh, is that because that, that supply chain has kind of recovered from the pandemic? Well, I think it's it's recovered, but there's still more demand than supply. I mean, overall, and that gets back to rivalry. When there's more demand than supply, industries tend to perform better. And and so if the supply chain balance comes into play, or let's say we hit a little bit of a, a rough patch economically over the next five years, and supply tends to start outstripping demand again, well, then industry returns will come down much more quickly. So that is the nature of that high beta. So you can also make the argument that it is a high beta and there's going to be booms and bust cycles. And right now we're in a boom cycle and eventually there's going to be a bust cycle. And, and when does that bust cycle occur? But it's going to occur. And at that point in time, this industry's returns will go down pretty dramatically. 
again, they may not go to negative spreads as an industry, but more and more firms will not be earning their cost of capital, at least during that period of bus cycles. All right, let's talk about competitive advantage. Clearly, you said earlier, uh, they have a competitive advantage because NVIDIA's relative spread is higher than the industry because they have an ROIC of 91 against a WAC of 13 with the industry at you know 58 against 12 and a half. So why does NVIDIA have a competitive advantage? What drives their moat? Steven? I'll take a crack at it. We It, it was kind of discussed earlier, but one of their uh, advantages is that um, most like language models and AI are being trained on NVIDIA uh, GPUs and the CUDA software. Yep. And so if they were to switch um, platforms, it would be uh, costly and difficult to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one reason. Yeah, and, and their platforms are you know, some of the best, if not the best commercially available to do that training. Uh, and, and so that is something that is protected by their IP that uh, has given them a lead. And, and again, that's part of why they're, they're, they're outperforming right now. Jim? Uh, from their Bloomberg article, they were talking about the uh, integration with uh, their data centers mm -hmm. and, and how their products all work together. And so they, they, they get this efficiency, um, be, having the fastest and uh, best products. Um, so I would I would say uh, industry leadership and just their uh, technical prowess. Uh, they're they're able to lead in the industry and and when you buy the GPU, you have to buy the network card and all the connects and all the other stuff that you need in the data center. It's not just the GPUs, and so they. Um, they get this like spin wheel effect um, with the data centers. And I think also um, they were, they were, they were talking about like automotive and um, there are other kind of tangents, like non really non pure tech related industries that are um, kind of being disrupted uh, by this, uh, by uh, AI and ML. So like, like it's not just one industry; it's like several in industries, um, all uh, clamoring for uh, in the NVIDIA platform, and so so you have this huge amount of demand. Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, I just had a question on on this Bloomberg screenshot. Is there a way to show like the industry average, excluding the company that you're looking at? Because I mean, if we look at like the market cap of NVIDIA, it's so massive compared to, you know, what else is listed on here. And I mean, Broadcom is like, what, 800 billion. But other than that, every other peer is like below 300 million, like a 10th of NVIDIA's market cap. So like clearly their ROIC is driving up that industry average pretty heavily. So is, is it like, is it worthwhile to analyze their competitive advantage excluding them from the average because i would assume that 57 would go down you know several points if, if we took nvidia out yeah although that's a little bit of a circular reasoning but but you could uh and in this case if i were in bloomberg right now i could just delete nvidia and recalculate uh, okay. and see that but but the point is you could argue yeah let's look at the exclusive average without them in it but the problem is that the industry is a lot of their sales are coming from NVIDIA. So when you say industry, it's like saying, I'm going to take 50% of the sales out and see how the other 50% do. Well, the industry is not 50%. The industry is 100%. So <laughs> that's what I mean by circular. So yes, I, I know it's driving up the performance, but they are half the industry. Right now. Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right. And so finally, what's going to happen in five years? I mean, I mean, the odds are, as I said, they're not going to be this level of outperformance for forever. So the question is, when does it start coming back towards the, the mean? I, I think reasonably in the next five years, it probably will. That That's just likely. Um, and, and so, you know, for reasons that they'll probably maintain their advantages, but I, I do think you're probably going to see 
more competition, uh, as we talked about in the five forces, potentially more substitutes and potentially some boom and bust cycles, which slow down some of the growth. So uh, odds are they're not going to maintain the spread. It'll still probably be pretty high, but slightly lower spread for the industry, slightly lower spread for NVIDIA, but still a value creating business, I, I think is where most of you probably should be ending up on this one. But this is EIC, using numbers, using data. This is what we want to start to talk about. So again, as you choose your companies for your group project, you'll be doing a similar exercise on them. Final questions about EIC. All right, let's talk about week three and what's coming up. So week two was all about EIC. That was kind of the first section of the class. As we move into week three, we're going to move into the second section of the class, which is historical, right? And the idea here is that, yes, the past doesn't guarantee future performance, but if we're going to forecast the future, we have to have a baseline. Got to understand what's going on in the past. And, and so there's going to be two parts of the historical analysis that you're going to do. <clears throat> Um, I don't know if you've watched any of the videos yet, but I'll preview what's going to be in the videos. And for lecture note purposes, we are going to be talking about lecture note two right here. Download the PowerPoint myself and share. Young? Yeah, Professor, I noticed that there are no grades that show up. Just wanted to see whether if that was intentional. That there are no grades? Yeah, uh, we don't get to see the grades on our assignments. Oh, I'll uh, see if there's a, a posting issue. But I, I haven't graded the EIC yet because it was just submitted. But as, as it's graded, yes, you should be able to see it. There, there's no issue with transparency of the grading. Uh, let me switch. Exercise not lecture note two. We are moving to lecture note, I believe, three. So take that back. Three. All right, so I, I'm not going to go over all of this because it's going to be in the video, but I'll highlight a couple things. Share three. Mm. So this is a graphical representation of what's called Medigliani Miller, okay? And it has four parts to it. It says, company's worth the sum of its future cash flows. So the cash flows are going to be broken into operating and non-operating. Operating or recurring that comes from customers as part of your natural course of business. Non-operating cash flows have nothing to do with sales, but nonetheless, they still have value. So for example, I got a bunch of cash in the bank. That's not operating, but it has value. I own a bunch of land, right? Again, that's not operating. It has nothing to do with selling products, but it does have value. So what we do is we value them separately and add them together. When we do, that is something called enterprise value. And is that enterprise value that you can pay to your stakeholders? Debt gets paid first, equity is the residual value, okay? So enterprise value is the operating plus non-operating cash flows. Enterprise value is also the debt plus the equity cash flows. <clears throat> the approach that McKinsey takes is adding an extra step. What they do is they take accounting statements and rearrange them and map them and put them into a Medigliani Miller format, that four box format. So we're gonna start with the accounting statements and we're gonna rearrange them and put them into that four box format. So we're not gonna lose anything when we rearrange it, but we are gonna rearrange it, okay? And that's an extra step that we teach in this class that they don't really do in other classes, right? Now it's extra work up front, but it has two advantages. 
Advantage number one, you'll see once you put stuff into an economic format, it's cleaner and easier to analyze. And number two, it helps give you a cleaner and more straightforward valuation. Okay, so there will be benefits to the format change, but I'll warn you that this is going to be the most difficult part of the class because it's kind of like learning a new language. <clears throat> and, and so one of the languages is when you rearrange the income statement, it's going to be rearranged to a statement called TII, total income available to investors. When you rearrange the balance sheet, it's going to rearrange to the to the TFI, total funds invested. Okay. And, and so that's the whole point. We're going to take everything that's operating off the income statement. And when we put it on the TII, that's going to give us our no plat or no pat. When we take all the non-operating income off the income statement, non-operating income, the operating plus non-operating, total income available to investors. That will equal the debt and the net income. Same thing with the balance sheet. We'll take all the operating items off the balance sheet, operating invested capital. We'll take all the non-operating invest items of the balance sheet, non-operating capital. Add them together, TFI. That will equal interest-bearing debt plus equity. Okay, And so both sides will end up balancing the investment and the financing side, and every item will be accounted for, but we'll put them into this kind of m and format. And then the whole point is when we create the cash flow statement called CFI, it's the difference between the income statement and the changed balance sheet. So operating no plat minus change in invested capital, that's free cash flow. Non-operating income minus change in non-operating capital, that's non-operating cash flow. Free cash flow plus non-operating cash flow, CFI, cash flow available to investors. That will equal the debt and the equity that needs to be paid out. Okay. And, and so Part of the homework is to learn the process. There's a video to do this. And then we'll start with simple income statements and balance sheets and you'll convert them. And that's one of your two assignments for next week, right? Assignment number two says, once we convert them, then we're gonna analyze them, okay? And so I wanna focus on that tonight as a preview. <clears throat> so when you analyze the statements, that will be lecture note four. Oh. Uh, professor, is the are the lecture notes supposed to be uh, visible to to um, downloadable? Yeah, can you not see the lecture notes? Yeah, we we don't see them. Hold on, lecture notes. Let me make sure there's no issues with that full. Sure. All right, the folder is visible. So in the file section, files is not visible. Why is the files not visible? Hold on, settings. So the folder is visible, but the file section in navigation looks like it was not enabled. So let me enable it. and save it <clears throat> so on if you refresh on your menu under vbic home page it should now say files and then when you go to files you should be able to get to lecture notes thanks for pointing that out thank you um so lecture four is where we're gonna get the analysis, okay? So let me go ahead and share this. There's gonna be, and again, the videos will cover this. So I'm gonna go a little faster right now, uh, but here's the idea. There are two types of historical analysis we'll do after we convert the statements. The first is called an ROIC tree. <clears throat> We're going to tree out ROIC. And the first level of the tree will say that there are three things that change and drive ROIC. Tax rate, operating margin, which comes from the income statement, 
and productivity, which comes from the balance sheet. And if we understand those three things, we'll understand why ROIC is what it is and why it's changing. We'll then do a second level analysis of the ROIC tree. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, operating margin comes from the income statement. What are the three drivers on the income statement that drive operating margin, gross margin, SGNA, and depreciation? What are the three drivers in the balance sheet that drive productivity? Working capital, PP&E, and intangibles. So we'll analyze both parts of the tree, first and second level, to understand what's going on with the companies that we're looking at. So as an example, here is an ROIC tree, go full screen, for Starbucks, right? It's five historical years. It's the way the tree is set up. And EOY stands for end of year. So it's based on essentially December 31st. So the way to read this, going left to right, is end of year ROIC for Starbucks, 2070 to 2021. In 2017, Starbucks ROIC is 48.3%. 2021, 23.2%. It fell 51.9% over that five-year period of time. Why? Three reasons. Reason number one, what happened to the tax rate? In 2017, their tax rate was 33%. In 2021, their tax rate fell to 21.6%. By paying less in taxes, did that help or hurt the ROIC? Should that help or hurt? Helped. Paying less in taxes hurt your ROIC? It should be helping. Yes. Lower taxes should raise your ROIC. Okay. So my tax rate is 22% versus 33. I'm paying less in taxes. I should have a higher ROIC. So this driver should be raising their ROIC, but it's not. Their ROIC went down. So their ROIC went down despite the lower taxes because their pre-tax ROIC, which is the business is selling coffee, went from 72% to 29.6. So it's all the operating performance that got worse. Why? Drivers two and three. What drives ROIC? Margin and productivity. This times this equals that. So margin, when they sold you a cup of coffee in 2017, they made 18 and a half cents. When they sold you a cup of coffee in 2021, they made 17 cents. Is that favorable or unfavorable to ROIC? Unfavorable. So that's driving the ROIC down. Productivity, invested capital to sales. To sell a cup of coffee, one dollar of sales required 25 and a half cents of investment on the balance sheet in 2017. To sell a dollar of coffee sales in 2021, one dollar of revenue required 56.6 cents of investment on the balance sheet. Is that better or worse financially? Worse, worse, worse. Starbucks is spending twice as much to make less on every sale. That's why their ROIC is going down. Now it's being slightly offset by paying less in taxes, but overall the ROIC went from 48 to 23. That's your first level of analysis. These three drivers will always explain the change in ROIC for any company. That's called first level analysis. Remember with me so far? Here's second level analysis. Why did the operating margin go from 18.5% to 16.8? Now we look at the income statement. Gross margin minus SGNA minus depreciation equals operating margin. So these three things explain that. So what happened that caused their operating margin to go down? Well, gross margin, price minus cost, cost of goods sold, so higher is better, went from 35% to 34%. They make 1.2 cents less when they actually sell the coffee, price minus cost. Their SGNA overhead, selling general administrative, 
went from 13.8 cents to 13.4. Relatively flat. Slight improvement, 0 0.004 improvement, but flat SGNA. So they lost a point of gross margin and had flat SGNA. Depreciation went from 4.8 cents per dollar to 5.2 cents per dollar. Slight increase. That 0 0.004 increase in depreciation was offset by the 0 0.004 decrease in SGNA. These two kind of cancel each other out. And this went down by a point. So that drop in gross margin was the primary reason the operating margin fell. What happened on the balance sheet? OpWC, operating working capital. This is working capital. This is PP&E. This is intangibles, spending on goodwill and intangibles. <clears throat> I'm going to start with PP&E. Property plan equipment, PP&E, is building land equipment. So that's the stores, the land, and all the equipment inside. In 2017, to generate a dollar of revenue, they spent 22 cents on PP&E. In 2021, to generate two, a, a dollar of revenue, they spent 50 cents on PP&E. That is far unfavorable from a productivity standpoint. They're spending a lot more on property plant and equipment than they did five years ago. Intangibles. They spent 8.8 .8 cents on goodwill in 2017. They spent 13.9 cents on goodwill in 2021. If goodwill's going up, that means you bought somebody. The biggest increase in goodwill be occurred between 2017 and 2018 when it went from nine to 19. They clearly bought somebody in 2018. I would expect you to know who they bought. And it was a coffee company, I forgot that, Kava or somebody? They bought a coffee company. Right? That's the increase in goodwill. But more goodwill, unfavorable to your ROIC. Working capital. Starbucks has negative working capital. They have negative five cents of working capital in 2017. They have negative seven and a half cents of working capital in 2021. That's favorable to ROIC because if you have negative working capital, you have less invested capital. And if you go more negative working capital, you have even less neg working capital. So that should have helped their ROIC. But unfortunately, the improvement in working capital was not enough to offset all the spending on stores and all the spending buying other companies. So that's why the productivity worsened over five years. Questions? Make sense? Are you following? I'm going to do one more. Target, retailer. Between 2017 and 2021, same period, Target's ROIC went from 13.5% to 21. It improved. Why? Tax rate went from 33 to 21. That helped the ROIC. But in addition, the underlying business of selling products at the Target stores went from 20% to 26% ROIC. So something else had to be favorable. <clears throat> Operating margin went from 7.2 to 7, flat to slightly declining. That's not why the ROIC went up. Pre-tax ROIC went up because of productivity. In 2017, Target was spending 36 cents per dollar of invested capital to sales. In 2021, they're spending 27 cents per dollar invested capital to sales. That is more efficient. That is the primary reason why the ROIC went from 20 to 26. Even though the margin didn't change, did anything change about the income statement? It did. Their gross margin was from 32.6 to 31.9. They actually make less markup when you buy a product off the shelf over five years. So it's either lower price or higher cost. But they also spent 22 cents per dollar on SGNA. Relatively flat, didn't change much. But depreciation went from 3.3 to 2.7. So even though the operating margin stayed pretty consistent, it's because a lower gross margin was offset by more efficiency and depreciation. These kind of canceled each other out, but there was a slight change in their income statement. From a productivity standpoint, they also don't have a lot of working capital. Zero working capital to negative five cents of working capital. They're basically not paying their vendors <laughs> and that is saving them invested capital. There's five cents of improvement. 
PPD to sales went from 35.5 to 31. They are getting store productivity, <clears throat> more revenue out of the same stores. There's nine cents of benefit. That's the nine. And intangibles are pretty much zero. They don't do big acquisitions. So no change in acquisitions, four cents of improvement on PPD to sales, five cents of improvement on working capital, that nine cents per dollar improvement. You add these three up, you get that number is why the invested capital sales went down, which is why the ROIC pre-tax went up. When you're doing these analysis, I want you to at least start with the beginning and the end while you're getting familiar. Eventually, I want you to care about the intermediate years, but you're always doing, did it change? And how does it affect the ROIC and specifically the part of the tree above? So don't just read a bunch of numbers and say higher or lower, that's obvious. It's did that change impact the ROIC favorably or unfavorably? Did it make it go up? Did it make it go down? Link, connect those dots. That's what the ROIC tree analysis is set up to do. Questions? Practice. I'm going to put into the chat a file that I'm going to be doing real next week with a company called RTX. They're a defense and aerospace company. It used to be called Raytheon. They merged and are now called RTX. And here is, and everything I'm showing is public data. Uh, but these are real ROIC trees from 2023, five years. And here is the file. I'll also put in that file folder later, but for now I'm going to put in the chat just so you have access to it. It's called the Defense and Aerospace Benchmarking Case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put you into ad hoc teams here. I'm going to give you 15 minutes and I want you to practice on the ROIC tree analysis. Okay. So the file that's here has a lot of companies in it. So let me share. Share, share. Here is Defense and Aerospace. So this is RTX, Raytheon, uh, which is basically, they got Raytheon, they make uh, Pratt & Whitney jet engines, and they also make uh, parts for commercial airlines, including the Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, so that's their business, about half commercial, half defense. But I also have some peers. So in this list is a five-year ROIC tree for Lockheed Martin, for Boeing, for General Dynamics, General Electric, Heiko, Helmet, Lidos, L3 Harris, Northrop Grumman, Rolls-Royce, Textron. Okay. And there's one additional part to the tree that was on the first tree I showed you in the lecture notes. In addition to ROIC, I have the year-by-year -year growth rate. So this is each year's growth, each year's ROIC, and this is the ROIC tree for the company. What I want you to do for 15 minutes is I want you to analyze the five-year change in ROIC of RTX, and I'm going to give each of your four teams, an, or I'll do three teams, I'll give each of your three teams um, one other company to analyze. Okay, And Essentially, I want you to analyze their five-year change of ROIC, why it's changing, and then I want you to compare that to RTX and tell me who's doing better, right? Over that five years in ROIC, is RTX doing better or is your peer doing better? Okay, so I'm going to put you into four groups. So breakout rooms, so put you into four. Four rooms. There we go. And I'm going to give you 15 minutes.
And when I hit open, it's going to move you to the room. So room one <clears throat> has Stephen and Terrence, amongst other people. So Stephen and Terrence, I want you to compare RTX to Boeing. Okay, that's your, your two companies you're going to analyze. Room two, which has Dara and Gregory, I want you to pick, compare RTX to General Dynamics. Room three, which has Jen and K Ann in it, I want you to compare RTX to uh, Textron. And room four, I'm going to give you dealer's choice. If you can see some of these companies over here, is there anybody that you want to do? RTX against somebody. You can do any of the companies that we haven't done yet. Pick one. Rolls Royce, Northrop Grumman, Lidos, Helmet, Heiko, Lockheed Martin, L3 Harris. Do you have a preference? This is Craig, Skyler, Sebastian, VJ. You're going to be room four. RTX against who? You're Lockheed. Great. You're Lockheed. All right. I'm going to put you in the rooms for 15 minutes. And again, RTX, five-year change. Understand it. Explain it. Your company, that the peer, five-year change. Explain it. Question number three. Who's doing better over the five years, RTX or the company that you're looking at? All right, go. All right, welcome back, everybody. Hope we had some good conversations. Why don't we start with room one? Uh, that was again Stephen, Terrence, Young, etc. Uh, go ahead and share your screen and do your two comp two company comparisons. Walk us through. My audio not working? Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like you're going to start with RTX. So tell us what you what you saw. So okay. sorry, I was having some some issues. Okay. Um. So with RTX, uh, we saw that it started at four point nine, um, and then by twenty twenty three, it hit three, and um, so the RIC went down. Um, even though their growth uh, and their growth rates seem to uh, have declined over the years as well from a peak of uh, after the pandemic, I, I think we can throw that out, but from 24% uh, to 2%, uh, their growth rate went down as well. Mm -hmm. um, so then looking at the tax rate, uh, it seemed pretty steady. They had a tax break in 2020, but most companies also did. Um, but it slowly decreased after that. Uh, or it, it went up to 15%, but then leveled out at 11. So from 2019 to 2023, it was pretty stagnant um, but, with minor but fluctuations. So going from 10 to a 12, did that help or hurt the ROIC? Uh, that's, it hurts the ROIC. Okay. All right, yeah. keep going. And then their uh, their earnings uh, went from 5% to 3%, which also uh, hurt their RIC. Um, so then if we look at their operating margin, uh, it, went, it went down by 50%. So that was a, a big reason. And then for uh, productivity, uh, it costed them 1.9 per sale 
and it went down to 1.5. So this is, uh, this change was good, but uh, it w did not outweigh the, the operating uh, change. When you say good, meaning it helped their pre-tax ROIC. Yes. So the R operating margin hurt the pre-tax ROIC going from 10 to five, but the investment capital sales helped it going from $1.97 to $1.52. But unfortunately, the overall pre-tax still went down. Yeah. Okay. Why did the operating margin fall from ten to five? Um, so if we look at their their biggest change was their gross margin. Um, that steadily decreased. I think that was a twenty percent decrease from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty three. Um, and their SGNA uh went down, but by a small margin, which is a which was good, but uh their de depreciation also. Uh, increased by the a uh, similar value, so they sort of offset each other. Okay, so is the is the drop in gross margin that drove the operating margin down? Yeah. Okay. What about the productivity, working capital, PP and E, intangibles? Uh, so for the working capital, that went down uh, substantially, which is a a, a good thing. Okay. Um, their PP and E uh, went down slightly. Um. And that, I think we we determined, was uh, a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, the intangibles, it went it, it spiked, but then went down. Um, and this is due to I think some of the merger acquisition stuff that was happening. Um, but that going down is also good. Okay. But the primary reason was the working capital went down, which drove the invested capital sales down. Yeah. Okay. Who's your comparator company? Uh, Boeing. Okay. So what's going on there? Um, just all bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it went from it went from bad to worse. Um, because, I mean the pandemic is huge, right? For for airline, so we see that the huge spike down here. But they started at minus one point nine. Uh, minus yeah, one point nine percent, and ended at. Minus three point two percent, which is worse than they started. Okay. Um, despite seeing revenue growth, um, it still is not enough to be profitable. Um, and then we see the tax rate, uh, go down substantially, which is was a uh, is a good thing, and uh, but that is outweighed by the their pre tax ROIC, which went uh. Oh, right, right. So we, we were a bit confused by some of the numbers. When you look at 2019 to 2023, that is, uh, it is down, but because they were very far down from 2020 to 2023, um, they were actually increasing their ROIC from this period of time. So well, it, was, it was getting more negative. I wouldn't say it was increasing. It went from negative seven to negative 36. That's much worse. Negative seven to negative thirty-six. The RIC is getting more negative for from between nineteen and twenty, and it started improving. Less negative between twenty and twenty-one. Got worse in twenty-two. It's still negative, but got a little bit better in twenty-three. So the five years of negative ROIC. Right. Okay, but it they're steadily trying to improve from twenty twenty. Well, and look at the next driver. Look at happened to their margin. Yeah, it's it's all negative. Um, negative two six two. What's the twenty twenty three? Twenty twenty three. It's it's hidden. One more seller. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. Minus. Point. So they're they're actually losing a little bit less, which is better, but they're still losing money, and their productivity's gotten a little better. Thirty eight to thirty four five. All right. In the interest of time, I, I just want to get a couple other teams in here. So thank you for for kicking us off and sharing. So how about room two? Who is your comparator company? We had RTX against. Room two was uh, Greg, Karan, Nathan, Dara. We had general dynamics. Right. Pop up GD. Everybody did RTX. So let's just focus on GD. What's going on, GD? Can you see the screen? Yes. All right. So to sum it up, so essentially, if we're looking at EOI, ROIC, in 2019, it's at 11. In 2023, it's at 10. So it did decrease over that time period. Now, the the um, 
the drivers for that, right? So looking at the pre-tax ROIC, it was at 13% in 2019, went down to 12%. That's not good. It means like we had a decrease here in our ROIC. That's not good. Looking at the tax rate in 2019, 17%, 2023, 16.8%. So it's less taxes, but it doesn't seem like that's offsetting the lack of, of uh, pre-tax ROIC. Now, what's driving our pre-tax ROIC is looking at our operating margin. So in 2019, it was a point, it was at like 11 cents. 2023, it's at 10 cents. So our operating margin is decreasing. Not a good thing. Investment capital to sales, it went from 87 cents to 83 cents. This is good, but it seems to that even though that's improving, that's not offsetting our operating margin decrease. Now what's driving the operating margin decrease the biggest factor or driver here appears to be the gross margin. It was at 0.19, went to point, uh, 0.178. When I'm looking at the SGA, 0.61 to 0.57, that's not a major change. Depreciation, 0.021 to 0.02, again, not a major driver. Uh, when I'm looking at OPWC to sales, 0.168 in 2019 to 0.164, that's con pretty constant. PPE to sales, 0.15 to 0.147. Again, not a big change. But when we look at uh, intangible to sales, it was 0.55 to 0.526. That's kind of a 3% change decrease, which should be helping and is probably the biggest driver behind um, the investment capital to sales ratio and why that improved. Overall, looking at this uh, firm, it appears that they're, they're decreasing but it's consistent. This could be just related to um, the industry as a whole and the fact that their operating gross margin is really kind of not, not as efficient as it could be. Thank so you. Who's, who's doing better, GD or RTX? I mean, I guess in my opinion, in my opinion, I think that GD is doing better, but I think that the merger of RTX hasn't fully like you haven't fully seen that develop. So in the future, I don't know. Today, I would, if I had to invest, I'd take GD. Well, it's not I had to invest. Just over the five years, GD is clearly outperformed RTX based on the data you said. All right, let's try and get to one more room three. Jen, KM, who'd you guys have? Uh, we had uh, RTX and uh, Textron. All right, why don't you talk about Textron? Let's go on to Textron. Uh, we put it in the sheet. Oh, wow, well, okay. Uh, and then, um, uh, actually, we had a question, Professor. Um, there, there's no WAC listed. Correct. On here. So we, we didn't know if if uh, there was value destruction happening or not. Well, that's um, what we're assessing here, but we didn't give you the WAC. Okay. Right. Keep going. So uh, we saw that Textron was, uh, their ROIC was deteriorating less than RTX. Mm -hmm. um, their revenue growth was a lot higher. Um, going to their uh, pre-tax ROIC, I, I just transposed these numbers from uh, the sheet. Okay. Sure. And um, I, I just copied these five-year change numbers. And so uh, the... All right, I'm going to stop you because when you do this, you got to be careful about the percentage change because the magnitude will be different on some of these numbers. Like a, a big percentage change could be go from a small number to a small number, but that could be a big percentage change. That might not be as meaningful as a smaller percentage change amongst bigger numbers. So they're really a guide as to whether it's going to investment, but the magnitude of the investment is actually more important when you do the analysis. So... Appreciate what you do with the percentage change, but that's that's not going to give you the analysis that I'm looking for. Okay. FYI. All right. So tell you what, we'll finish this next week and we'll also do some CFI practice. But in the interim, you're going to have a homework assignment, which will be doing the ROIC tree analysis and a CFI analysis, as well as the conversion. <laughs> so this was a preview of, of what we're kind of getting into. Uh, but what I would tell you is... <laughs> The analysis, very important. And I think I say this in the videos, but number one, make sure you're referring to numbers. 
make sure you're referring particularly the tree, how it's affecting the other part of the tree. When you talk about CFI, how it's affected the actual cash flow of the firm, um, and, and then talk about whether it's getting better or worse. All right. So I don't want just to be a regurgitation of numbers. All right. That that's not what this analysis is about. Obviously, you got to regurgitate the numbers, but you got to talk about connect some dots. Is it making things better or worse as you go through the analysis? So connect it to the ROSE, connect it to the cash flow. That's the practice that I'm going to want you to do. Okay. So we are at the end of time. Um, any final words before we turn everybody loose tonight? All right, this was recorded nonetheless. I will post that. And again, good luck with the next two assignments. And I'll see everybody in a week. Have a good night. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.